name is Letitia Burr. I wish to leave a record of plantation life as it was. Truth may thus be preserved among a few. And merited praise may be awarded to noble men and virtuous women who have passed away. Good morning, Miss Letty. Good afternoon, sir. 
sir. Won't you come in? Miss Burl, it is an honor to make your acquaintance, ma'am. Thank you. My name is Captain Joshua Thomas Beauregard. I'm a friend of Captain Jimmy Breckenridge. Is Jimmy here? No, sir, I don't believe he's here yet. Has not arrived yet. Um, no, but he's asked me if you will stay with us this week. Oh, I would be glad to, ma'am. I, I came in on the train a while ago, and uh, I have my horse at the barn, but my bags are going out uh, on the old mill road. I'll have to have them diverted. Well, can we send someone after them for you, sir? I'll ride down myself and take care of that. Right, I've got fine. some things that we need to take care of. And Jimmy's not here yet. I'm, I'm disappointed. I greatly want to see him. Well, I think he'll be here very soon. I have been out in Albuquerque, New Mexico with a paymaster named James Longstreet. He and I have been stationed out in this brown, dry, desolate place, and we both swore if we ever got back east again, we'd stay right here. Well, you are certainly welcome, sir. Thank you, man. You have a wonderful home here. Well, it's a home on a bound. Now, Ms. Burrell, you have four daughters. Let's see, there are Letitia, Rosalie, Mary Frances, and Catherine. Daddy, Kate, Rosa, and Fanny. And how are things in Washington City, sir? Oh, ma'am, you don't want to know. After 15 presidencies, the Whig Party is trying to come back to life. They are running a liberal candidate for the first time to think they're going to win. Now, Lincoln just lost the Senate seat to Stephen Douglas, but we have not seen the last of him, I fear. No, I'm sure we have. These people want to take the United States government and make it superior to the states. Oh, my goodness. They do. They want to run an entire empire just like we got away from in England. Well, I'm so glad that you are here to inform us of this. Oh, man, it's awful. I fear for this country. I greatly do. We are going to be in a problem, a world of hurt, if these liberals have their way. I can understand that, yes. The, the founding fathers didn't mean for that to be the case. True. Virginia is Virginia. Yes, it is, and it always will be. And it always will be. Thank you, ma'am. Might I see around this lovely house of yours? Certainly. Right this way, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Why, so, you must be the celebrated Captain Joshua Beauregard. I'm Letitia Bow, but you may call me Letty. Miss Letty, it's nice to meet you, ma'am, now that I know of your family and your personal names. It's a southern tradition, Captain, to have nicknames. If one should refer to us as Letitia, Catherine, Mary, Frances, or Rosalie, we should know them on a formal basis. But if they should say to us, Letty, Kate, Fanny, or Rosa, well, you see the distinction, sir. Indeed, ma'am. It's nice to be included in the center circle. Not at all, kind sir. We should always welcome the very first of people when we so encounter them in our midst. I fear my humble holdings have been somehow exaggerated. Oh, sir, one is not always to be judged by what he owns, but rather by what owns him. Your defiance for the Southland, sir. It is one of the very crowns which you shall one day throw at the feet of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Miss Letty, ma'am, it's nice to meet you. Captain Beauregard, may I present my handmaiden and my best friend in the world, Lucinda Bow. It's nice to meet you, Miss Lucinda. Thank you, Captain Bow. Captain Bogart, sir, the pleasure's all mine. I'm quite sure. Captain Beauregard is here with Captain Breckenridge as his guest for a couple of days. Ladies, I'm going to have to go down to the train station and have my luggage diverted up here. I shall be back presently. Cinda, I think you're quite taken with our Captain Beauregard. Father Cinda Burr, is that the first white man who's ever kissed you? 
I do believe I see a blush across your delicate and dusky features. Hmm. Don't play me for no fool. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You know that boy? He got to salt the cow to get the cat. Mm -hmm. If you don't watch it, he gonna own both of us. Send the bell. What am I gonna do with you? Girls, you're never gonna believe. I heard the other night that Wilma Johnson had triplets. Can you imagine? <gasps> triplets. Oh, goodness. oh my God! Did you hear that? Must be Fanny Burl. It's so nice to meet you. You're even prettier than Jimmy said you were. <laughs> Thank you. I'm gonna be staying with you ladies a couple of days here. I'm gonna go up to the house and talk to your mama. All right. Good to see you. Good to see ya. Why, Captain Beauregard, I see you have returned. Yes, Miss Letitia. Please, Captain. Letty would please me infinitely more, sir. If I may depend upon you, ma'am, call me Joshua. Joshua it is. Done. You know, Joshua, Jimmy thinks the sun rises and sets in you. I am so glad he has someone to look after him when he is away from Fan. Thank you, ma'am. Even someone of your interesting character. Twice today you have caused my heart to leap within me. First by that most impassioned of speeches for the Southland, and then to honor my handmaiden with such a... such a... Compliment? Yes. I do not believe that has ever been done to her before. And never in such an outlandish fashion. Were you offended? Not in the least, sir. But you have to understand. Few people look upon their servants as family members, whether they have black servants or white servants. We at Avenel are an exception to the rules of convention. Our servants are neither chained nor tortured. They come and go as they please. They see Avenel as their home away from the rest of the world. They read, they write, and they think for themselves, all one hundred of them. They have their own money. Many are trained craftsmen, sir. I take it you do not have any servants, Joshua? No, ma'am, I do not. And yet you are so understanding of our plight. The rest of the country is not yet willing to treat all men as equal. The Yankee writes back home. He thinks it's a shame to see blacks and whites walking down the street together, hand in hand, arm upon shoulder. But it is evil to think a man beneath you simply for the color of his skin. You're forgetting about slavery, sir, our peculiar institution. Who said it was yours, Miss Letty? How was that, sir? I said, who said that slavery was yours? I'll wager that you yourself have never purchased a human being in your entire life. He would be correct. And yet you own Lucinda Burl. And if she came to you as the friend that she is and asked you for her freedom... Would you not move heaven and earth to give it to her? I would sell all that I had to give her that which she desires. You are a noble woman, Letty Burl. Slavery is not your fault. It is not the fault of the Southerner. It is not even the fault of the Yankee flesh merchant who brought the cursed practice upon our shore years ago. It is the fault of the African. It is the fault of the Pharaohs. Go back in the Bible. To the pharaohs in Egypt. Your words, sir, are a great comfort to me. It is that god-awful party of Whigs, liberals, collectivists, which cause me to see blood red. The northern liberal, who is the Yankee, and the southern liberal, who is the scalawag. 
These are the demons which will tear our country in half. Many of our friends in the North want the conservative form of government we have enjoyed since Thomas Jefferson. Oh, why may we not unite as one? Northerners and Southerners purging the Yankee evil from among us. Slavery is dead. Patrick Henry knew it. He stopped the slave trade in Virginia. These are not slaves to you. They're not even servants. They are burls. They are your family. Oh yes, Captain Beauregard. Say on, sir. Say on. If the Yankee has his way, there will come a time when even the Lord God Almighty will not be welcome among us. The Yankee is a god unto his miserable self. Yes, it is that, and it will be that. They must be stopped, sir. They must be. What rips at my soul, Miss Letty, is they have offered me a colonelcy if I will join them in the coming dissolutionment. They haven't. Oh, yes, they have, and they have offered noble Robert E. Lee the command of that evil empire which will rip apart the United States of America. You shall not, sir. You cannot. Virginia will never hear of it. I cannot. I will not raise my sword against my home state of Virginia. I will not raise my sword against my home state of Virginia. Miss Letty, I greatly fear that I have shamed you and everyone here at Avenel. Should your father require satisfaction of this liberty I have taken, I should like to give it him. If he should require pistols at dawn, I shall meet him on the field of honor when and where he likes. I shall not bring a pistol with me and I shall pray that he not turn away the shot when the time comes to defend your honor and your dignity. And I shall trouble your household no more. Captain Beauregard, sir, may I trouble you with a word before you go? It was an accident, Captain Beauregard, and we must regard it as such. If you are at all interested in my honor, sir, you shall remain here as our guest and as Jimmy's dear friend. In you, sir, I do see the South. I see her honor reflected deep in your beautiful blue eyes. And I love her, sir. I love her very much. I feel her in your face and in your beard. And I love her. Good day, Captain Beauregard. I trust I shall see you this evening. to marry a woman, it will be that one.
Well, it's Cinder Bell. I was wondering where you were. I was just making sure you were safe. Why, I don't think Captain Beauregard meant me any harm, Lucinda. You mean Joshua, don't you? Why, of course I mean Joshua. Where were you? It's late. I was getting worried about you. Then in the quarter, checking on to get some information on Captain Joshua. Oh, Lucinda, not that. You know how I feel about the black arts. It ain't me that did it, Miss Letty. Lucinda, that's voodoo. That's what it is, Miss Letty. It's voodoo. For them that does it, but they will never part from it. Lucinda, I demand to know who is practicing Satanism on our land. You must tell me. That's just it, Miss Letty. That ain't Nap that knows. But you hang on to Captain Joshua. Letty, this man is exactly what you need, child. If anybody gets you away from here and on your own, it will be him. I am honored to meet the builder of Adamel House. So, the house is a wonder and a marvel, a delight to the eye in every way. My land is situated on the southern end of Bedford County as one begins the long journey towards Hales Ford. It is in the vicinity of Wolf Creek out on the old mill road. Huh. Well, we're practically neighbors, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. You own no slaves? No servants? No, sir. My family never worked a plantation of a size to command such assistance. My grandfather had 119 acres and many children to work the land. My inheritance was the three acres of which Captain Breckenridge spoke, as well as some other holdings. A lot of that land had been sold once I had received my portion. Grew tobacco, did your grandfather? Corn, wheat, other staples? How about cattle, sir? Indeed he did, sir, just as you say. Well, if you're ever in need of any slaves, Abinell will be glad to provide you with however many you need. They enjoy going out and seeing other places. They're not confined here, sir, in no way at all. Why, well, thank you, sir. Well, sir, you're so impressed with Abinell, allow me to show you around. We have our own vineyards, you know. As a matter of fact, that's one of our finest vintages that we just had. We are looking for this year to be an excellent year also. Thank you, sir. Hello, my name is Lydia Webb. This is Burroughs. I'll be with you directly. It's a pleasure, Ms. Webb. Mm, notorious supporter for it. And this is my associate, Mr. Sagacious. Jonathan Sagacious. Ms. Webb, it's a pleasure. May I take your hand? Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Mrs. Burroughs will be with you directly. <laughs> will you just look at what washed up on our porch just now? Who in the world is that? I've never seen him before in my life. 
clearly one of Father's social experiments. Most likely a riverboat gambler or a land speculator. Father is always so drawn to the best society has to offer. Rosa! I have to agree with Rosa. If that man is not carrying a pepper box revolver and a boot knife, he is missing an excellent opportunity to do so. Now, where did they go? Well, who, Portafor? Those lovely visions of the Lord's own kingdom, who were lately up by that great window up in that hallway up yonder. Thought, Portafor, that one could only speak of the Lord if one had not sold his soul to the devil. Well, I haven't signed any papers yet. <laughs> Although I may have to do so if that lovely vision of femininity doesn't descend that flight of stairs and come join us presently. My, she is delightful. Those are Burwell girls, Porter Foy. That grandfather was secretary to Thomas Jefferson in his first term. You remember Thomas Jefferson, don't you, Porter Foy? That's who our soon-to-be president was named after. Mr. Jefferson Davis. Sir, you need to show some restraint in looking at those girls. Well, I am a gambler. As my name implies, danger is part of my profession. I've been in three duels thus far, and as you can see, I'm still unscathed. Honor is a very silly thing. When your opponent draws his pistol, fires it in the air, and says, Honor has been served. I often say, why couldn't Anna have been served after lunch? <laughs> the most terrifying thing about a duel for me is getting up before dawn. <laughs> well, the three witches, pray give me the eye. Let us just look at, oh no. What is it, sister? What do you see? Oh, Lord, sisters, that man, that's notorious poor for the riverboat gambler. <laughs> I recognize him from the magazine illustrations and even several photographs Father brought back in his periodicals. Who or what is a notorious port for? Him. That, Rosa, is a notorious port for. Wait a minute. I've read about him. He's only the best card sharp on the river. He even has one of his own rooms assigned to him on board of one of those paddle wheelers. The Bride of Babylon, the most gaudy, ornately decorated prostitute on the river. How nice of him to come down here and sanctify our home. I hope Father doesn't owe him any money. From the way he's looking up here, one of us may be going home with him. Fred, he is looking up here at you. Who, oh, dear? Notorious Portafort. He is looking up here at you, Fan. See him? Oh. Uh, I thought he was looking at me. I shall have to move to one side to see if his eyes follow. Do you think, Letty, or is it best not to know? I think we should all stop acting like a bunch of 13-year-olds and go down at once to greet our guests. I lady, I swear. What do you want about Rosa? If God had created her first, there would be about six people on this earth and Adam would be bored out of his mind. Dear lady, it must be Rosalie Burrow. Indeed, sir, if you insist upon it. However, you have the advantage over me, I fear. You know my name, but I do not know yours, if you are not notorious. And if so, sir, for what are you noted? Dear lady, I am notorious for many things. But tonight I am simply notorious portafoy at your complete service. Charm, sir. A friend of father's? M indeed, miss. And your father was very much a friend of mine this past several months in New Orleans. I often heard him speak of Avonel, but never of his youngest daughter, to the point that I should now have expected. And why is that, Mr. Portfoy? Why, your beauty transcends even Magnolia Blossoms themselves. I should have thought that you would have been in every one of his thoughts of home, and that your name would have begun 
every sentence that contained the word Virginia. Oh, this poor boy. Perhaps if you knew me half as well as he, you would not think half so highly of me either. Would not happen, Fair Blossom. You see, I'm a foolish man, and my world revolves around beauty. So how the beauty ever offend me? <laughs> Master Portafoy, perhaps you would care to join the gentleman on the front porch there and join bourbon and cigars. Miss Burl, I thank you. But I must speak the truth. I do neither drink nor smoke at all. It is one of the devices I attribute to my success at the tables. You would not believe how this concerns an opponent when you don't have to rely upon any vices. Try, Mr. Portfolio, do. You are simply incomplete, sir, without these fine pair of vices, having mastered all the others. It simply won't do, sir, not at all. Perhaps a shrewd, then, since I am not at tables. And since my lovely hostess insists upon it, evening. Any word from Captain Breckenridge? I am not, sir. I am really beginning to grow concerned about him. He's not usually this late at any time. The train ride in was long, and I am very tired. How are the horses? Horses are fine, sir. The other men are taken care of? Fine, and I've uh, been very quiet today. We'll just have to wait, await developments on him to see what happens. Sir, I'd like to ask your fix on disillusion here. Well, hello. How are you, sir? I'm good. Your name is? Henry Simpson. Oh. I believe we know your father, Cornelius. Of course, he would be interested in coming to the solution, and would he not? That's right, sir. Well, sir, I believe that this solution would be probably the worst thing that could befall this country. It would mean, sir, that the North had lost its mind and that the South had followed suit. You may trust, sir, however, that I shall follow my country. I need to know, would you intend to stay with the Union if Virginia leaves? My country, sir, is Virginia. Yes, sir, Virginia. Most definitely Virginia. The federal government only has 12 enumerated rights, and they get all of their power from my home state of Virginia and 33 other states in a so-called Union. Do I look like a Yankee, sir? Do I sound like one? And answer that question for yourself. Does it look like I will become one? Excuse me, sir. I need some air. Does that answer your question, Simpson? in from the porch. I was invited for bourbon and cigars. Seems I like two vices and Miss Burwell is been on having me become a complete man. And now that you have, do you feel better? Immeasurably. Now, Rosalie, where did she get off to now? Well, she was entertaining me. Mr. Portafoy, Rosalie is engaged to be married. Her Fiance is a physician from Kentucky. I understand you hail from Mississippi. In a manner of speaking, ma'am, I'm from all up and down the mighty Mississippi, yes. Yes, William told me that you are a professional card player on a riverboat in Mississippi, but Rosalie's fiance is a physician, sir, on dry land. Well, I pray that they'll be happy together, ma'am. Well, I pray that too, sir, and when Dr. Todd arrives, I shall introduce you to him. I should like nothing better, Mrs. Burrow. Thank you. Good day. Miss Burrow is nothing to be trifled with. They call her Old Miss. Looks to me like they should call her Old Iron Fist. Fortifoy, <laughs> I'd suggest sticking to the known and familiar more familiar turf. Turf. Horse races. 
Kentucky. Dr. Todd may be a blessing to me after all. <laughs> Think I'll have to try my luck on dry land, as our charmingly determined hostess insists. Oh, for you're incorrigible. <laughs> did you come up with him? Who? Who do you think? Portafoy. I met him in New Orleans and when I was down there publishing those papers I've been working on for months. What's he done? Well, nothing really, and, and, and that's the problem. He does nothing for a living, but he seems to get along very well. I must learn his secret and apply it to myself. You did, dear. Remember, you married me, and now you have Avenel. Avenel is your darling. It's a woman's house. And Portafoy is definitely a ladies' man. Oh, I don't know, Mama. He's all right, I guess. I mean, he seems polite enough. It's just we already know him to be making judgments about him. Poor fan. Looking the, for the good in everything when there isn't any good to be seen. Mother, really now. Listen to me, dear. Uh, he seems polite enough, but so did the serpent in the garden, and you see what that was. Well, I just saw well marry him then. How's that, Mama? Don't jest in that manner. It scares me, Pam. Well, we see some strange things here over the years. I just don't see a problem with him as a person. He seems nice enough. So much to learn about people, especially men. For once, I agree with your mother. And do you have any idea how infrequent that is? <laughs> Well, we seem to be agreeing a lot lately, and to tell you the truth, it concerns me, it really does. Well, it's because we're parents, and we agree that we just want the best for ours. I am happy with my Jimmy, I think, or at least I hope to be. Well, good choice. Excellent military man, excellent character. I can't argue with that. At least he owns his own horse. I prefer horses to boats, anyways. There's not enough water around here. And I don't see myself in Mississippi, not for a minute. I am a true Virginia girl all the way around. Thank God for Jimmy and Dr. Todd. Amen. <laughs> well, fair blossom. What might your name be? Elizabeth Ashley. Elizabeth Ashley. A pleasure. The tortoise Porter Foy. Nice to meet you, Porter Foy. What do you seem to be reading? I'm reading about Mozart. I'm starting to be a concert violinist over at Randolph Macon Women's College. Oh, I want to be just like Alicia Jade. <laughs> Lisa Jade and I go way back. We travel up and down the Mississippi on the, the Bride of Babylon together all the time. Oh, you know about the Bride of Babylon? Of course I do. I've been on that ship so many times, they ran the sweet after me. Oh, I've <laughs> always wanted to be on one of those river boats. Well, maybe I could take you one sometime. We oh. can travel up and down the Mississippi and see all the sights. I would like that very that much, Mr. Poor Boy. Wonderful. Yes, I now, know. are you friends with the Pearl Daughters? Oh, yes, I'm friends with Rosa. Rosa. Beautiful girl, but she does not compare to the beauty that sits before me. Oh, mm. Mr. Portafoy. Portafoy! I see you've met my daughter. Daughter? Portafoy, I think we need to retire to the porch. Indeed. <laughs> I don't. I, I couldn't lose him. I couldn't deal with that. Virginia will have to sacrifice greatly in, 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 in its manpower and its blood. We need to negotiate. It's honorable to negotiate and yes. compromise. Yes. Husband, what do you think about a tyrant like that coming down to full force? Well, it's a blatant act of disrespect. You know, I, I stand with Virginia all the way. I, I do realize that we are one country and it would, it would be a horrible shame for Christians to fight a war and shed blood, but um, you know, if they send their mob down to Virginia, then we have to stand for our state. This is our land. This is our home, so. No, I disagree. I disagree. I disagree. Negotiation is the only way. Negotiation is the only way. Well, I'm willing to listen to this man that's coming to speak. What, what was his name? Uh, Miss Buchanan? Miss, no. What was his name? 
John B. Floyd. John B. Floyd? I never heard of the man. Have you heard of him? Yes, I have heard of him. Secretary of War. Very high hopes with him. I remember John B. Floyd's father when he was the governor of Virginia. Miss Letty Burrell is very fond of him. Oh, good morning, ma'am. I'm John Buchanan Floyd. I'm here to see the Burroughs, if I may. Nice to see you, sir. Come on, we've been inspecting you. Thank you very much. Can I get you anything, sir, while we were waiting? No, thank you. I'm fine. Oh. Thank, thank you very much. You're welcome. Our secession will not be over slavery, or tariff taxes, nor even states' rights. It will be over a refusal to attack the Confederacy. I really wish we didn't have our servants sometimes. We could travel, just go anywhere, whenever we got ready to go there. Oh, wouldn't it be lovely? Just think, just lock the house and be off. I don't know. I'd really miss our servants. They are so much like family. <laughs> because they gave them our last name. No, really. I hate to see Jordan or Doc or Lucinda leave us. Yes, it would not be Avenel without our second family. Well, just think. If they weren't here, we'd have more to do than just stand around wishing they weren't here. We'd have the cooking, the cleaning, the sewing, the cleaning. Did I mention the cleaning? Rosa. No, nope. I much prefer standing about wishing they weren't here than to actually see them leave. See you, sir. Come in, come in. Thank you, Burl. Wonderful place you have here. It's just as I thought it would be. Well, we try to make it a nice place to live. And your vineyards. Why, Jordan gave me a glass of your house wine on my way in. It's magnificent vintage. Lots of rain last year. The grapes uh, hold very good promise this year also. And your staff, your servants. Why, they seem so proud of the place. We don't have slaves here, sir. We do have servants. They read, they write, they know different trades, and they can be trusted to leave the plantation and come back on time. They're not confined here, sir. Why, Robert asked me for his freedom, and I gave it to him. I thought he could look after himself. Fantastic. Why doesn't everyone do as you do, sir? Why doesn't everyone write as well as you do, Poe? It's because they can't. I am pleased that you appreciate my humble scratchings, Burl. We, we all do, sir, especially the little ones. Why, they have just been pleading for you to read the railing for them once again. Would you, sir, tonight read to them? Why, even eleven-year-old Letty loves to hear you read. As you wish it, sir, I am your obedient servant. Excellent capital! Now for another libation.
Ms. Letty, what is your pleasure? The raisin, Mr. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently tapping, tapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this, and nothing more. Ah. Distinctly, I remember it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember brought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly, I wished to borrow, vainly, I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore. And so, to stop the beating of my heart, I stood repeating. Tis some visitor entreating infants at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating infants at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more. Presently, my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore, but the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here, I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Back into my chamber turning, all my soul within me burning. Soon again, I heard a tapping, so much louder than before. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least on Bayes it's lady, not a minute stopped for staying, but with mean of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door. Perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. This heavenly bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the stern and grave decor of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven now, I said, art sure no craven. Ghastly grim and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lord the name is on this night's plutonium shore. Who's the raven? No more. Much I marvel, this I vainly foul, to hear discourse so plainly. Though its answer, little meaning, little relevancy more. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon a sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on that placid bust, spoke only that one word as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing further than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, no more. Startled by the stillness broken, I reply so aptly spoken. Doubtless what it utters is its only stock and store, caught from some unhappy master whom a merciful disaster followed fast and 
followed faster till his songs that one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of never, never more? But the raven still beguiling on my fancy in the smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door, then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, fancy under fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, gaunt and ghastly, ominous bird of yore, bent and croaking, nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing, to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining, on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamp light floated o'er. Then we thought the air grew denser, perfume from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim, whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath fled thee, by these angels he hath sent thee. Respite, respite and repent from their memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh, quaff, and sky the dread, and forget this lost Lenore. Close to Raven, no more. Prophet, said I, think of evil. Prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent, but with a tempest tossed the air ashore, desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quoth the raven, no more. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, held this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden, whom the angels name with all, clasp a rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels name with all. Quoth the raven, no more. Be that word our sign and parting bird or feet. Thy feet upstarted. Get thee back into the tempest of the night's nice plutonium shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul has spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quick the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Close the raven. No more. Then the raven. Never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of the palace just above my chamber door. His eyes have all the seeming of the demons that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming casts his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted. Never more. Thank you, Miss Letty.
my dearest Letty Burl. Jimmy and I are once again scouting for General Jackson. I have asked that Jimmy be allowed to accompany me. His commanding officers have all unanimously agreed to this. It is hoped that he may best recover from his loss with the antidote of work. We are also now counted among the spies, Letty, that most questionable of services one may provide one's country. But, as it is necessary, we have indeed answered that call. It is worse than I thought with him since Fan's passing. He misses his dear little wife so much. As you may know, Letty, my grandfather's grandmother was a full-blood Apache Indian, and it was she who taught our generations the fine art of scouting. We can track a grizzly bear or the entire Yankee army and know its size, its strength, its direction, and its intentions, all from the vibrations it leaves upon the ground. It is hoped that the faulty information General Jackson received at Kernstown will never again be repeated with us in the saddle, and that will be the only battle he will ever lose. So perfect and noble a warrior is he. At times, Letty, Jimmy and I portray Captains Bartholomew and Barton of the 105th Pennsylvania, returning Yankee deserters to their lines for court-martial. Please don't think ill of us for once again wearing these now-hated uniforms, for they are rightfully ours, Letty, and not these Yankee impostors who have stolen our flag, our uniforms, our capital city, and our national freedom. Captain Bartholomew with the 105th Pennsylvania. Yes, sir. These deserters were picked up just outside your camp. Got about five of them back there. You may want to see to them. Take care of your men, sir. Take care of your men. I got to meet President Davis on the steps of the Confederate White House, lady. It was brief, but magnificent. I understand, lady, that Miss Mary Lee General Lee's wife is planning to come and stay at Avenel some during the summers for her arthritis. I know you must be very proud and excited to have such a distinguished guest at your home. I imagine such visits now also come from necessity since the Yankees have stolen Arlington House from the Lee family and are now busy converting it into a Yankee cemetery burying bodies as close as they can to the home so that it may never again be used as a private dwelling. I cannot imagine how poor General Lee must feel having the ancestral home disfigured in such a manner. During my brief visit with General Lee, he praised Captain Breckinridge for holding up General Averill for an hour and a half at Kelly's Ford. He also intimated to me that he plans to visit Avenel once hostilities have ceased. I imagine the whole town would show up, Letty. I know General Lee would be welcome in just about any home in the South. Of late, old Jack begins to worry me, Letty, with his incessant talk of not wishing to outlive his country. I do hope the Lord does not soon call him home. We would surely be lost without our fine General Jackson. Lee says that old Jack is his right arm. I'd be willing to wager somewhat more than that, as our friend Notorious Portafoy would say. Still the fighting goes on, Letty. <laughs>
You'd be excited, Miss Letty, to know the names of the socialites and the society regulars who meet us all up and down the Potomac at night and give us much-needed gifts of quinine and other medical supplies paid for with their own money for the Confederate cause. These are the true heroes of the South as much as anyone on the battlefield, and one day I shall speak their honored names in your presence. One day, hopefully, General Jackson will take us to great victory. One day, when you least expect me, darling girl, turn around. I'll be standing right behind you. Your Joshua. It's, it's, it's not bad. Just don't take my leg. Don't, no, don't. It's, it, it's gonna be fine. It's gonna be fine. Just relax. Just relax. You're, you're going to be just fine. I'm not gonna take the leg. It's just a, it's, it's just a good flesh wound, and it's gonna be fine. Just calm down. Just relax. Just relax. Let me get to work on it, and you'll be fine. Just, just take it easy, just take it easy. Let me wrap it up. <clears throat> oh, I wish I were in the Just, just try to take it easy. Try to relax. Just try to relax. All right. You're going to be just fine. You're going to be just fine. But sir, you're not going to touch but, this but patient. Sir. He's my patient. It doesn't make any difference. Sir, I want to bust you. I want to kill him. I want to kill him. I want to kill him. I want to bust him. I want to kill him. I don't want to kill him. I don't want to kill him. We don't need it, sir. We need to put him down. We've been killing him. Go back where you came from. Get back down to here. You can put the knife away, sir. You can put the knife away. Get him later. Thank you. If it's anything I can ever do for you, let me know. All right, just, just right now, just lay back, take it easy. Let me finish working. Just take it easy.
seen you, Cap Boulder guy. How are you? Glad you're here. Thank you. I'd offer you coffee, but uh, there is none, as you might imagine. I find that most disconcerting. I enjoy my coffee, as you know. Uh, I have a few moments uh, to talk with you. Uh, I have some affairs I must attend to shortly. Captain Breckenridge and I have been scouring the countryside, trying to get the limits of the Yankee cavalry. They seem to be everywhere. Well, I, I know that uh, we had a, a brief skirmish with them near Hall's shop earlier today, and uh, I'm hoping to get some reports from, from that. I do know from your cavalry's reports that uh, the, the 18th Corps is near Hanover. Yes, sir. But I fear that's a ploy in order to draw my army out and fight on ground of his choosing. So I've taken measures uh, to, to avoid the 18th Corps. It appears to be no threat to this army at the moment, but I do need to know of its movements. This General Grant seems to be quite elusive. <laughs> He's not only elusive, sir, he, he is everywhere. He has cavalry stretched for miles back back from Hanover, just everywhere. I fear that his intentions are to draw us into a siege before Richmond. And I assure you, sir, if we can avoid that, we should at all costs. This army has not been driven from the field. And I believe that as long as it's free to maneuver and fight, they can defeat any army that Grant may throw against us. I fear the unmanly war of numbers and attrition will be the tactic he uses. If we can maneuver him into the proper position and fight him on ground of our choosing, encourage him to attack us, as he has done in Spotsylvania and the wilderness, then that may not be so. We can only hope. He has sacrificed a good many of his men trying to take us, and there is no limit to what he will do in that regard. I believe it's so. But that well could be his doing in. Let us hope, sir. Let us pray. But first we must find him, Captain. I must know where his army is positioned and how it's deployed. That. I believe will tell me what he has intended. That is our great problem at the moment. Just when we think we know where the nucleus of this thing lies, it proves to be too vast to circumvent even in a day's ride. He escaped us in the wilderness, again at North Anna, and then yet again at Spotsylvania Courthouse. Not escape us forever. If you will forgive me, Captain, it's been nice, but I must attend to some affairs of the Army. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. It's nice to see you, sir. Good Be see you. safe. Thanks, sir. May God go with you.
My goodness. General Longstreet, sir. Hey. Hey, how are you doing? You? It's good to see you. Fine, fair. Fine, fair. And you? Very well, very well. My goodness, you're looking well. Thank you, sir. It's been a while, has it not? Indeed, it has. Yeah. Quite a while since Albuquerque, New Mexico. Oh, my goodness, Albuquerque, yeah. <laughs> how in the world we managed to have a good time out there in that sand hole, I don't know. But we did. Yeah, you know, when I left Albuquerque there after resigning my commission, my intention was to go to Alabama and offer my services to her since she's the one who sent me to West Point. I got down to uh, Corpus Christi there on the boat to go over to New Orleans where we were going to catch a train, and I ran into this fellow, or Tom, uh, two actually, Tom Lubbock and one, one is a Tom Gorey, Thomas J. Gorey, a Texan. And he convinced me just to go on to Richmond and uh, have an audience with President Davis. So uh, that's what I did, and instead of becoming a major or maybe a lieutenant colonel as a paymaster, well, I ended up brigadier general. Wow. I made an uh, infantry brigade, 4th Brigade, up at uh, Manassas Junction up there. Uh, it certainly suits you, sir. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah. We've, uh, we've gone through quite a bit here of late. Uh, yeah, I've, I've seen something happen here that, uh, well, some people predicted it was going to last two months. And some said six. I said from the outset, uh, this thing was not going to be a quick, uh, a, a, a quick maneuver. No, sir, this is going to last years. And here we've been at it, what, three years now, and, and still no end in sight. Not a bit. Yeah. And I said then, if uh, you know, you could look for three years. If we go five, you look for a dictatorship. Definitely. But, uh, but something's got to happen. Well, you know, the South is running out of manpower. Sure is. We keep uh, having these uh, victories, as I call them, but they're hollow victories. They're period. Because we win the day, we, we carry the field, but then when we leave the field, we've lost uh, 10, 20, 30, 40,000 in casualties that we can't make up. Uh, Federals, they've got uh, plenty of manpower sources that they can draw on, but we can't, and we keep losing people at this kind of rate. Uh, so they're going to get somebody in there up north that realizes this just a war of attrition, and they're going to pour it on us one of these days and just grind us down to nothing and knowing that we can't replace these people. And that might be the death knell for the Confederacy, I'm afraid, if we don't hurry up and get something done here pretty quick. You know, I, I heard a fellow one time say that Sam Grant looks to him like a man who is determined to run his head through a stone wall and is just about to accomplish it. <laughs> and uh, I figure that's just the best uh, description of Grant I could think of, you know. <laughs> Most definitely. Yeah, Sam, he's something else. Uh, I wish we could meet again on uh, friendlier terms. Yeah. Yeah. That would be nice. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, business been good for you, huh? Yes, sir. We have been, we've been most busy trying to get the troop movements of the Yankees where they're headed, what they're thinking. Mm -hmm. We've been all up and down the lines. Every once in a while, I have to portray Captain Bartholomew with 105th, mm -hmm. and uh, we actually wear our old uniforms and go right into their camps. Definitely. Well, sir, good to see you again, sir. Well, it's been my pleasure. My pleasure. It's been too long, and I guess you're staying out of the out of the limelight, I suppose we could say. And so therefore, we don't get to see much of you. Maybe a spell. Well, once hope. in a while, I'll slip by. Well, I hope so. Hope so. We don't yeah. get caught up in this mess. We have Breckenridge and I both have recurring nightmares that we're going to one day get caught. Mm. Well, if that happens. Well, then that's God's will. Well, that's true. You know, you know, they are rough on people doing what you do. <laughs> They catch you to catch your goods on you. Well, oh, we're dead men if it happens. Oh, yeah, that's an, unfortunately, that's, I know that to be the truth. Yeah. We've got forged papers from both sides, and none of it will be any good. <laughs> mm, yeah. Well, I wish the best of luck to you. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, you're quite welcome, sir. It's been an honor again. Yeah, it's an honor as mine, sir. And you take care of yourself now, and you stay low. Sure will. Thank you, sir. All right, sir. Won't be long now, Bo. Lee's losing a hundred men a day to desertion. 
where President Davis is since Richmond fell. South is done for, Bo. Done for. Looks that way. Never keep anything from you, huh, Bo? Even when we were little boys together. Remember, Bo? I remember, Brick. I knew you'd come. You think I'm gonna eat this thing, don't you? No, Breck. I didn't think it. I was sure of it. Oh, you were right, Bo. Fan is dead. South is gone. And what do I have to go home for? Tell me. What's an Avenel for me, Bo? What's left? I came to say goodbye. I came to ask you to follow Jubal Early and I down to Mexico. You'll have Letty Burl waiting at home for you. It's a lot to go home for, isn't it? Tell me, Bo. Why aren't you going for her now? Why aren't you going home to her now? As I swore, I would not return to her till I had saved the South and redeemed the Confederacy. Lofty goals, my friend. Good luck with the Mexicans, amigo. Captain Breckenridge, sir. It has been an honor. Captain Beauregard, I would have it no other way. You have been and shall always be my friend, sir. My best and one true friend in the entire world. Thank you for allowing me this exit. And please tell Letty that the Yankees got me. For truly, sir, they did. They did this to me. The secret is safe with me, sir, sir. So carry it to my grave. The secret of my one and only truest friend. How many you reckon, Breck? Well, man, let me see. It's probably Hancock's boys out there and they never travel light. Can you see the bayonets? Yeah, I see them. All in a row. Bo, I'm afraid I've got you killed too, brother. I didn't want to go to Mexico anyway. Yeah, they know we know and they're just playing with us. If we turn to run, they're going to shoot us in the back. That's a coward's death, Breck. I won't take nothing in the back. They'll shoot us anyway. They shoot spies and scouts on sight. At least I think they do. I'm ready. Are you? Let's do this, my friend! Hey! Billy!
pleasure. Reports from General Jackson's command in the Shenandoah indicate the tragic loss of both Captains Jimmy Breckenridge and Captain Thomas Beauregard. These men exemplified the rightness of our cause. Captain Breckenridge distinguished himself mightily at Kelly's Ford. Their loss is great to the South, as well as to liberty and freedom. General Hunter, I've been advised of the situation and I will be back with him within a half an hour. serving in Mexico. You came over from General Scott's headquarters to visit Garland's brigade, to which I then belong. I remember your appearance and I'm sure I would have recognized you anywhere. Yes, I know we met on that occasion, and I've often thought of it and tried to recollect how you looked, but have never been able to recall a single feature. That was some army we had back in Mexico, wasn't it, General? Those were very different times, indeed. I suppose, General Grant, the object of our present meeting is fully understood. I ask to see you to ascertain upon what terms you would receive the surrender of my army.
So I don't know the manners of good society, eh? Well, I guess I know enough to turn you inside out, you sock dollar guys and old man trap. I'll be along shortly, Lucinda. Joshua, Joshua. Joshua. Joshua, where's Joshua? He ain't here, Miss Lady. But he was here. Just now he was. He was here. He was here. Come on, Miss Lady. It's time for bed. I know, Miss Lenny. I see him too. You do? Really? 
Y'all not see him now. See it? Yes, I see him. I see him now. I understand. I understand now. It's time for us to go, isn't it? Time for us to be on our way.